rigid body dynamics. And what we've put together so far was uh, the two separate situations of either pure translation, uh, which wasn't terribly different than uh, uh, an awful lot of what we did with the particle dynamics in translation, other than the fact we had to use the rigid body part and, and actually set the rotation to not be zero to guarantee we only had translation. Then we did look at the rotation, pure rotation, on Friday, and then now we'll put the two of them together and look at what we call general motion studies. So that's the, the deal that uh, if we've got some object with a center of gravity somewhere, and subject to any types of forces of any magnitude, any number, any direction, that those are going to cause, uh, assuming that there's no net uh, assuming that there is a net force after all those are added up, there will be some acceleration of the body, and we looked at that in the translation part. But if there's also no, uh, if there is a net torque, then there can also be some kind of rotation. We'll look at the possibility of the two of those now together. So, uh, if you remember, this is a, a kind of a combination of a free body diagram where we show the object plus any forces on it, and a kinetic diagram where we show the result of the resulting motion if those forces are unbalanced. And the little piece that we put together um, last week still is applicable. Uh, in that if uh, the points the points that we're interested in might be different oh let's be consistent put this in blue I don't like combining different vectors the pink ones are the force vectors if we're looking at, at some other point then this uh, business of using the um, new point, maybe call it uh, point P, if we uh, sum the torques uh, with respect to G, that will be IG alpha. But if we want to do it with respect to some other point, I guess this class uses M, don't we? Every book's different. Every author's different. I don't know why I don't sit down and talk about it one day. If we do that, if we sum the moments about some other point, we need to use the moment of inertia with respect to that point, which we may not have, but we can go ahead with the parallel axis theorem and use the moment of inertia about the object's center of gravity, which we typically do have. So that uh, kind of business we set up the other day still holds. It's just with the translation part, the uh, uh, <coughs> angular, uh, rota angular acceleration was zero in this equation, but not in this one. Uh, now it's non-zero in both. And so we'll be able to put the whole general idea of this motion together. All right, so let's do a, a couple problems and step through uh, uh, doing
doing exactly this. So, imagine we have a drum of some kind, maybe just sitting on a tabletop. It doesn't matter because what happens is uh, we have a, a cord wrapped around it such that there's a force applied to that cord and that will lift that drum off the floor and start to turn it. And so we want to find both of those, uh, both of those possible, both of those uh, quantities. So we want to find, actually we want to find three things. Find the acceleration, the translational acceleration of the drum. Find the angular acceleration and also find the acceleration of the cord or cable itself. So that's the general setup. <coughs> I'll put a couple points to it, a couple values. Let's put 180 Newton force on there, a radius of half a meter and a mass of 15 kilograms. Okay, so all this is, we're going to find those three things, uh, assuming it all starts from rest. So, very simple setup, very simple problem. Start with a free body diagram, and then a kinetic diagram. No, it, well, it's, it's got the cord wrapped around it. That just guarantees the no-slip condition if we need it. And it's just sitting there, and this force is applied to it. So because it's an upward force, you know, when it's just sitting there, it's in equilibrium. Now there's an upward force applied to it. It's going to be unbalanced. The, the, it'll be in uh, uh, no longer in static equilibrium. It'll be in uh, dynamic motion upward. So we just want to find out what that is. And it becomes pretty obvious why that should be the case once we put the only two forces in the problem on there. There's no normal force with the floor because it's, it's just started to be lift, just uh, being lifted off of that. Uh, we could add more to it, I guess, if, uh, if we want friction with the floor and the like, but we're not going to bother with that. So because of this, there'll be, we suspect, some acceleration in the y direction. There could be some in the x direction. Doesn't appear likely. There aren't any forces in the x direction. But uh, just to be complete. And then there's also now an angular acceleration that we need to find. Once we've got that business, we can find the acceleration of the cord just based on the acceleration of a particular point on the rim where the cord last touches, uh, wherever the cord's coming off from there. Whatever the acceleration is of that point will be the acceleration of the cord as well. So, very simple setup. Let's. Uh, what we have. If the forces are unbalanced in the x direction, we'll have x direction acceleration, but uh, there aren't any x forces, so there can't be any x acceleration. So, by whatever notation method you prefer to, to go, we, uh, we're pretty quickly able to establish that. Um, kind of a no-brainer. We do expect, though, there to be Y acceleration because there is now a, a net force upwards and we need to see if we can figure out what that is. So, uh, subtract 
subtracting the two forces will give us the acceleration in the y direction. However, as usual to this point, there's two unknowns. Sorry? Uh, oh, T is known. Um, yeah. I was amazed how easy a problem I gave you. So we can find A, Y here at this point, because T is given. Good thing Travis was awake. Appreciate it, Travis. And so we know, uh, we know all those pieces. W, remember, we don't consider as an unknown. When we put in all those pieces, we get uh, an acceleration of 2.19. Uh, then we can sum the moments about some point. Um, we know T, we know W, it doesn't really matter. We could solve something about either one. Uh, probably be easier about G because it's just a simple drum. And so uh, IG is just uh, straight out of the book. So summing the moments with respect to G, then the only uh, unbalanced torque is that due to the cable. So that's a distance r away, of course. And then the moment of inertia of a drum, uh, right out of the book, I think it's, yeah, 1 half mr squared. Alpha, and uh, so it's all for alpha. Alpha equals uh, no, I have a minus sign right now. Uh, we already know what direction it's going to be. And that comes out to be 48 radians per second. That's all for that's in fact that's physics one stuff for the most part. That's uh, this is a, a problem, wouldn't be any trouble doing physics one. <coughs> What about the acceleration, though, of the cord? How are we going to do that? Be the same as the acceleration of point A. We're going to do that. Uh, that would be fine if what was true. But Joey, Joey said, just make this A equals R alpha. That's the acceleration of point A relative to G, but G itself is accelerating. The, the object as a whole is accelerating. But we can use those very ideas. Um, <coughs> but we can uh, we can find out the acceleration of point A using our relative acceleration equation. So A G uh, that we already have. It's a 219 meters per second squared in the plus j direction, because it was a, an acceleration in the y direction. What about the relative acceleration? So that we've got. about the relative acceleration. 
part. Yeah, you can do it as a cross product, but remember with these two dimensional problems, everything's um, perpendicular. All, all of our, almost all of our vectors are perpendicular anyway, so there's two parts to it. There's one part in the tangential direction and one part in the normal direction. Which implies, of course, a normal and tangential coordinates. Where do those go? Well, uh, what point determines what these are? Remember, it's a point in rotation that determines what, uh, where those directions are and how it's moving at the moment determines those directions. Remember, tangential is generally in the direction in which that point is moving about some center point, and the normal is towards that center point. Point A, we'll have a normal direction there. It's going to move up like that. It'll be a tangential direction. So just as Chris said, a normal, uh, the, the tangential direction in the Y. How big? Let's see, A, Y, we've got 2.19 J. I'll put the units on at the end, meters per second squared. What's the tangential component of the acceleration of A relative to G? That is our alpha, and we have both of those. So R was 0.5 meters. Alpha we have is 48 radians per second squared. So the units are going to match meters per second squared. And that's in the J direction. How about the normal direction? This is just R alpha E tangential. And that R alpha comes from uh, the cross product. How about the normal direction? Any point that has any circular component to its motion is going to have some centripetal component to its acceleration. And that's what we're trying to register here. The full cross product, if you remember, is omega cross quantity omega cross r, if that helps any, from the looks it doesn't, r omega squared. R omega squared. And that will be in the i direction, which is not rotating yet. We're at the instant that this force was applied. There's been no chance for any angular velocity to uh, make itself present. So we only have that last little bit then. And uh, this part comes out to be about 24 meters per second squared. So the whole thing together, 26.2 meters per second squared. Um, about 10 times the acceleration of the drum itself. We, the drum, remember, has an acceleration of about 2. This is 
more than 10 times that. So if you were uh, designing this, um, maybe you're some kind of uh, winch system, uh, you're going to have to take into account the acceleration of that cable just to get a certain acceleration on the, uh, on the drum itself. So, a lot bigger, a lot, lot more acceleration there. Okay, so this middle part could add any one of my Physics 1 students do. Well, not any one of them, but several of them. Uh, this part is, is a, a part we need to pay attention to more now that we're sort of here in the advanced physics one. All right, any <coughs> questions? Do another one sort of like this one? might be uh, exactly the type of design you want to do if you're making a, a thing that will lower and raise and lower the uh, curtain in the theater. So imagine a, a spool type thing. There's a, a larger disc on the outside and a smaller disc on the inside. The larger disc that might represent the, the curtain there is pinned at the top and then wrapped around the, uh, the outer part of the spool. And then the inner part has a hundred newton force on it. So some of the other pieces we need. Uh, a total mass of this system of um, 8 kilograms. Radius of gyration <clears throat> which sounds like how much room you have to leave between you and the next person on the dance floor. That's what it sounds like to me. Radius of gyration is 0.35. We talked about that on Friday. And the two radii of the two different discs inner one and the outer one, outer one I call one, is 0.5 meters, the inner one I call two, is 0.2 meters. And so we want to figure out a couple things. The tension in the line over here, if you were actually trying to design some uh, curtain raising system. You'd want to make sure that the curtain wouldn't rip and the whole thing would drop. Also find the acceleration of the uh, system as a whole and its angular velocity. Angular acceleration, sorry. All right, so find those two bits. Start with a free body diagram, and then a kinetic diagram, and then uh, we can just start setting things up and solve for the unknowns. All right, so you get started on those two diagrams. happen. 
simple. You can put them on the same one, except none of you are using a colored pen, so that's not going to have to use pens and pencil, you can get away with it. But be very careful. You can make different types of arrows. But in general, I wouldn't recommend putting very similar looking arrows to stand for completely different things on the diagrams. difficult. We've got the applied 100 Newton force. We also have the unknown, unknown tension over at that edge. And then of course the weight of the uh, system that we're lifting. And the kinetic diagram seems pretty apparent there won't be any y acceleration, but there sure should be some. Uh, sorry, there won't be any x acceleration, but there sure should be some y acceleration. That's the acceleration in the center of gravity. And then, uh, because of the setup, we certainly expect there be an angular acceleration. And the kinetic diagram is the result of the unbalanced forces and torques that uh, are causing the motion and some of the other forces like the tension. All right, once you've got that set up, then start setting up the equation. Solve them as best you can. positive in the 
direction we expect the acceleration, angular acceleration, no, not absolutely necessary. Uh, but just to be consistent. So we have 100 at R2. R2 is 0.2. That will be in our positive direction. The unknown tension will be at R1 in the opposite direction. So have a minus sign on it. And then of course W will cause no W. No, I'm sorry, W will cause no uh, no torque about uh, with respect to G. And uh, we, we have the radius of gyration, not the moment of inertia, but the two are uh, directly related, not even worth considering a separate unknown. Yeah, so we've got all those pieces then. Um, what do we got? Three unknowns. One, two, and three. So we need a third equation. And summing the forces in the y direction won't work. Could sum the moments about some other point, I guess. It's not always an independent equation. What's the third equation then? Three unknowns. Only two equations. Third equation. David? How about some of the forces acting on the curtain then, right? Cable. Uh, well, we could, but the, all that's going to tell us is whatever tension is pulling it down has got to be yeah. equal to the reaction of the roof holding it to the top. So it's not going to help any. The no slip condition, how do we apply it here? Where? Actually, we want to do it on this diagram. Yeah, the point on the air circle where the force is So this point yeah. on that. Um, you, I guess you could. It's just that point itself is accelerating. So it's going to make things a, a little bit more problematic. But it's the right idea. What? Point on the big drum. Right there. This one? Yeah. Yeah. That makes more sense because this is, if this is a no slip condition, remember that point at the instant. No matter what the motion is, if there's no slip, then that point's not moving. It has no velocity at the point, at the, the uh, instant shown. So that's the one where it's clear to make the no slip condition. So that would be then our no slip condition of. Uh, <coughs> of AG equals R, in this case it'd be R1 alpha. And uh, direction is shown. Okay, so there's the three equations, the three unknowns, and uh, it can now be solved. So that's a matter of um, algebra. That's not why we're here. So 
let me give you the solution of that algebra. The physics is all done. 10.3 radians per second squared. And then what's called the tension in the tension in the uh, line is 19.8. And that's, uh, notice, not simply the difference between the tension up and the weight down. Uh, if that was the case, then we wouldn't have acceleration. All right, do this. Set up this, the, the alternate solution by summing the moments with respect to that point out there in the ring that we call it A. Just set that equation up. Uh, it gives you the same solution. Um, it happens to do it... Uh, You could actually get, um, yeah, you can get alpha uh, and AG with just that and the uh, no slip condition. And then T you'd still have to get in some other way. Well, the first equation. So it's not going to save you an equation on this in this case, but uh, I'd like you to set it up to make sure you have all the pieces to it. purpose of doing this, if you did, was to eliminate T from the equation. And remember, when we do this, uh, when we sum the moments about some point, we need to take the moment of inertia with respect to that point. Which we don't have. But you can handle it. I'm confident. So with respect to point A, we have both the weight and the 100 Newton force are exerting moments with respect to point A. Its moment arm is R1 plus R2 with respect to point A. So it's 0.5 plus 0.2 meters is the moment arm for the 100 newton force. The weight is exerting a moment in the opposite direction, and it's only R1. So a minus sign and the weight was the 785. So those are the two moments being exerted. Equals the moment of inertia with respect to an axis through point A. We don't have that moment of inertia, though. We have the radius of gyration with respect to G, which we use to get the moment of inertia with respect to G. So we can use that if we also apply the, the parallel, parallel axis theorem, which 
with the uh, no slip condition yields. Uh, M A G T. So that we can do. We have the radius of gyration. The mass was eight plus A G M. A, G, D, and uh, that'll be in the positive direction as shown. So the positive sign here is okay. Everybody comfortable with that positive sign? Uh, we're looking for A, G. And then D is uh, R1. Oops. We still have two unknowns in there. Oh, I put in, yeah, I put in the R twice. I gotta stop talking while I'm writing. Yeah, so that's I alpha plus M A D. <coughs> This one doesn't happen to make the solution really any easier. Um, I don't know if this equation was in any way more difficult than that one, probably another way around, but it is. Uh, very often you don't know that until you've actually set them up, which one is the easier. But it is a way to check problems when you do have the time. All right, time to lay down some bets. Everybody ready? All caught up on this? All right, so everybody get your spare change out. We're going to make some bets here. What I've got is a simple spool with string wrap wrapped around the axle. So, something like this. First thing I'm going to do is to let it sit on the table and I'm going to just simply pull on the string. Not very hard, I don't want the thing to slip. If I pulled it hard enough, it would just yank it right off the table and that's no fun. So I'm just going to pull on it just lightly. We have to lay down our bets now as to what will happen. I'm not going to pull very hard. Remember there's a, uh, a static friction between it and the, so I don't want to pull harder than that because then it'll just start sliding off and that's not what we're going to do. So I'm just going to pull lightly on the string, and you get a bet what you think will happen. I guess there's three choices. Nothing. I'll pull on the string and nothing will happen. I just, I'll have to keep pulling and pulling and pulling and pulling until the string breaks, I get tired, or class ends. Two not in any particular order, rolls to the right. Rolls to the left. Other possibilities. Flies. Leap straight up. Flies. Goes down through the table. That'd be pretty Is possible. Yeah, but I don't know if we actually want it out there. Actually, Alan, 
you, you probably have four or five more yeah, answers. Four four four. Four. Depends on if you do. Well, it depends on if you're talking quantum. We're going to back you. Four is Alan. We'll back you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I didn't know I was possible. But, but now I you am. do not have to vote for that if you don't want to. All right, Phil, got a choice? Don't give it yet. Make sure everybody's got a choice. Anthony, you ready? Joey, you ready? David? I guess so. Tommy? Everybody's ready? Samantha? You like number four? Okay. Here, I'll, I'll just put down who, uh, just a mark for who votes for which one. John? Whatever Alan says. Come on, give me an answer. <laughs> You're right. We'll one, two, or three? Two. Ken? Two. Samantha? One. Travis? Two. The tribe. Anthony? How hard are you pulling it? Just lightly, very lightly. Chris. Two. Two. Joe. Three. Bill. Two. David. Two, but I'm not betting anything. Yes, you <laughs> are. <laughs> Alan. Two. Two. So no, nobody took four. We got one each on the other two. All right. So let's. Uh, let me set it up just like we got there with the string coming over the top. Just sitting there and I pull this way. And it rolls that way. Not a big deal <laughs> if we think about it. <laughs> no, what? We're not to it. Huh? No, no, well, you, you hang on, we're not done. This is part A. That's part of it. Um, if we look at it, if we look at the, the kinetic diagram, we have the force in the string that way. There's static friction back that way. It's actually the torque those are applying that cause it to roll. There's other forces. Of course, it's weight and it's normal force. Those are not dynamic forces in this problem. Those are static forces in this problem. The uh, normal force is important because it determines the size of the friction force. But in terms of the kinetics of what's happening, the dynamics of what's happening, there's no, uh, no concern with those forces. And so we have then, if we sum the forces about that point, or sum the moments about that point, we very clearly have a moment in that direction. All right, that's part A. Part two is the same thing, only now I flip it over and the string comes out the bottom. So, very same thing. I'm just going to flip it over oh, yeah. so the string comes out the bottom like that. Just pull lightly. I'm not, I don't want it to skid, so I'm not going to pull very hard. Just pull very lightly. Same choice. Start with that one this time. Same choices. Nothing. Rolls to the right. Rolls to the left. Rolls to the right. In, in reference to just how it's pictured there. All right, Alan. I'm just gonna pull on it lightly, right? Yeah, just gonna pull lightly. Two. All right. There's one vote for two. Phil. Three. 
David. Two. Joey. Chris. Three. Anthony. Two. Two. Oh, this is much more exciting. John. Three. Ken. Three. Three. Nobody votes one. I guess you're all assuming I'm actually strong enough to pull hard enough. All right, so, Joey, you're closest. You verify strings on the bottom. There it's just sitting there. So now it's just this setup. And I'm going to pull it lightly to the right. And it moves to the right. So whoever said two is correct. Why is it, though? Because an awful lot of people certainly thought it was going to go to the left. Let's look at the free body diagram. We now have a force like that. We still have friction like that. And there it is. Huh? <laughs> there, there's proof right there. there that picture is not significantly different than this picture, especially if we look at the torques about the bottom point. That's the point that doesn't move, uh, so that was a good place to set things up. So there's less torque around that point, and I don't know uh, how apparent it is. It's uh, kind of dependent on me, my ability to pull with the same force. I don't know if it's apparent which one's faster. Not really, I don't think. Um, there is less torque here about that point, but it's still in the same direction as it was for this situation. So uh, both answers were it rolls to the right. So um, those seven owe those four lunch. I figure. Well, David wasn't better. What? David wasn't better. So I one out. Oh, okay. Which one? You bet three or four? Two. two. I mean, two. three or two. two. Oh, two. so you two. sorry, you don't get lunch, David. That's fine. Because you it's didn't four. bet. You know, if you, nothing ventured, nothing gained. Yep, I know. Fair. So, so those, get those surprised. three get an even better lunch because David has to sit out. You have to go, though, and watch. No, I'll just do my own No, lunch. you have to. That's what you you've got. What you no got? hall passes for this, David. Uh, right. Having lunch is worth having to buy someone else. Okay. So, okay. so let the uh, let the physics explain to you what's going to happen. Don't always trust your intuition, especially when your intuition is a bit immature. I uh, know, uh, malformed, uh, 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 young, accurate. Just not ready yet. You're just not ready yet. You know, it takes a lot of years to get a real accurate intuition. Uh, and in fact, uh, only a few select geniuses actually do. And then they become teachers. All right, so here's another problem. A truck, my truck, so it's an awesome truck. with a unsecured barrel on the truck. All right, some of the, some of the details for you here. The big barrel. Um, has a radius of gyration of two feet. A weight of 200 pounds. What an R. That? No, it's a K. <laughs> well, we've just gone through this before. It's a car. Previous diaries, and that's a K. Don't make me mad just before I write the final exams for the term. 
radius of 3 feet. The acceleration of the truck is 5 feet per second squared. And coefficient of tri friction between the uh, tank and the floor, static coefficient uh, 0.15, kinetic coefficient 0.1. I think that's all the pieces. So find the angular acceleration of the tank on the truck bed. Remember, it's not tied down. So as the truck starts to pull away, it's going to sort of pull out from underneath that tank and cause it to start to turn. So we can use as usual, a free body diagram and a kinetic diagram of the tank. So I think I gave you all the pieces you need. Radius and gyration, K, W, R, and acceleration, and then the coefficients of friction. Yeah? All right, so set the equations up on an algebra class, so we won't spend the time to actually solve them. But we've got to have enough equations and enough unknowns uh, or we're not going to be able to solve it. And there's a little bit more subtlety here because uh, we've got both coefficients of friction, both static and kinetic. And you have to think about what's going to happen with one or the other. By the way, those seven, uh, I'm included in getting a lunch too, so I'll take David's place. No, no wait for the truck. You like chicken tenders? The, the truck weighs a gazillion pounds. Perfect. Got them. Digging grandmother, grand, my mother in law for a drive. Just kidding, Nana. Think about, think about how the static and the kinetic friction come into play. Without paying attention to those, you won't have enough equations, but you have to make an assumption to choose the right one of those equations. So, free body diagram. Let's see, the, uh, the truck's pulling forward, so it's going to exert a friction force like that. Oops. Of course, it also has weight, which we know, and a normal force, which we don't know. But since that's the complete uh, free body diagram, it should be obvious that n equals w in this case. Not always remember, but certainly does in this case. So we won't even take n as a, a separate unknown. And then the, uh, the kinetic diagram uh, would seem obvious there's going to be some angular acceleration, but it's going to move at least somewhat with, uh, with the truck itself. So if you were standing to the side here, you would see it start to move to the right and start to rotate counterclockwise. 
friction force on that other diagram. What? Friction. It's right there. Oh, okay. What, 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 what did you think was missing? Uh, it just seems like there should be one in each direction, left and right. Well, this is <coughs> caught, remember, friction is caused by contact with some other surface. So there's only one other surface it's in contact with, which is the truck. And the truck's going that way, so it's going to try to drag the uh, the uh, <coughs> drone that way. Bless you. All right. So we can set up the equations. See how we're going. In terms of unknowns and equations, um, don't need to do it in the y direction. We can do that in our head. Uh, and that just tells us n equals w. So we have uh, nothing more than f equals mag. So that's two unknowns, because F is unknown and AG is unknown. M, we don't have the mass, but we don't consider it an unknown. So we can sum the moments about where? make most sense to do it about G. One, that's where we know the radius of gyration. And two, if we do it about some other point, things get a little funny because those points are moving too. Those points are accelerating too. So I think for a starter it would be easier doing this. And pick a, pick a direction. Let's see. So uh, F, let's put those in the same direction. F times R is the torque with respect to G. And the moment of inertia is from the radius of gyration, and then we're looking for alpha. So we have. Uh, Two equations, three unknowns. <clears throat> we don't know F, we don't know A, and we don't know alpha. So what do we do? The point of contact. No slip. Well, uh, no slip then is Thing I, I can't use the kinetic. You, you're, you're, you're making a determination by saying that. Yeah. And it may or may not be true. There could be an acceleration of the truck that's so great that the, uh, the truck bed and the, and the tank actually slip over each other. And we don't have an equation for that because that's a that's that's a matter of degrees. It depends on how much slipping is happening. So what do we do? Tangential acceleration here. Well, what about it? We'll probably have to consider it both for slippage and, and you know, slip. Yeah, we're going to have to. Uh, you have to do something first. You have to make an assumption of one situation or the other and then see what happens. And see if there's a self-contradiction. Yeah, if we get down to the bottom and that assumption can't be true because we get something else that isn't true either, then we know that assumption won't hold. The only assumption we can make is, well, we can either assume it slips or assume it doesn't, but only one is quantifiable. In other words, only one will lead to an equation for us. I believe we got the limit of this, you know, where it starts to slip. It's just using the normal force rate. I believe the acceleration of the bottom equals at. 
Well, that's an assumption. Okay. That's the that's an assumption of no slip. So uh, we can make that assumption. It leads to a third equation, and we need a third equation. We can then find out if that leads to any um, weirdness. Any what weirdness? Yeah, any weirdness. Uh, other than what's just normally resident in the classroom in one day. But no slip is the only <coughs> one that we can use to quantify things in any way. So the, uh, the, if we assume no slip, then the acceleration of this point will be the acceleration of the truck. That's given, uh, and then we can use that. You can use that to uh, no. Remember, you've got to. Uh, uh, we've got to apply it in this way: that the acceleration of the point G is equal to the acceleration of the truck plus the acceleration of G relative to the truck. And the R alpha is only part of that. Maybe I shouldn't list it, list it as T because uh, that's actually G, G relative to, to T. You need the R alpha plus A G. Yeah. So to, to be more complete, I need to actually say that's G relative to T. Because that point does have the acceleration of T, but don't forget that the tank is rolling as well, so it's not uh, directly the acceleration of G, which we need for R alpha. So acceleration of T we have, the acceleration of G, this is all in the I direction, so it makes it kind of easy. The acceleration of G we want for here, and then alpha we will be able to find from uh, the whole piece. So, uh, turns out all of this is in the I direction, so we uh, don't need to uh, do it strictly as a, a vector equation, we can do it as a magnitudes. And then this is, uh, that's the R alpha part. And is the direction appropriate? No, there's a minus sign in there. Because of the opposite direction in which that's turning. So there, that's the only piece we need. So then I think we can find all the pieces. Yeah, we've got all the pieces now. So why don't you finish that up? And that'll be it for the day. Well, sort of. We need to get this to some certain point and then determine if this assumption was okay, the no slip assumption. The way to do that is to find out what the friction force is and see if that's less than the maximum static friction available. If it is less, then it's a good assumption. If it's more than that, then our assumption's invalid. So check that F is greater than or less or equal to 
the maximum static friction. Which we can get because we know the uh, normal force is 200 pounds and the uh, coefficient is 0.15, so that's just 30. So if you solve for the friction force and it's less than the 30, then our assumption is okay. If it's not, if it does slip, then, uh, then we can't solve it. It's not a, a problem that can be solved empirically. So, finish that up. Give you a little algebra to do, and then uh, double check the assumption. Right. Got it, Travis? That's oh, that's alpha. It seems a little more than I had. I'm sure I was reading the right one. Yeah, that's more than I had. But. Uh, should be positive. We already took care of the fact that it's in the opposite direction. So let's see if somebody else gets your numbers or my numbers. Did you check F, the friction force? It mm -hmm. worked okay. Good assumption. No. What did you get for the friction force? And I can't read that. Oh. Yeah, that's way above what I had. Thirty pounds. Uh, I didn't pick it. That's the limit for the static friction. Remember, static friction is variable. It goes up to a maximum and then things start to slip after that. Remember that? So the maximum point right here is the normal force times the static coefficient. And that's the 30. We need our force of friction to be less than that, down here somewhere. Because the, the likelihood it's right at the very limit of static friction is, is uh, not common. You're right at that point. Substitution to make then. 
you need all three of them in the end because uh, didn't ask for L, F, but you have to find it to check your assumption. So uh, whatever's the easiest way to solve those three equations for the three unknowns. Anybody else get Phil, what'd you get? Thanks, Bill. Where, where were you on the lunch boat? Do you get lunch? I, I don't get lunch. Okay, now you do. For a great one. David, you're still out. That's fine. <laughs> Sorry. I'm not a gambling person. I guess not, even when you're right. Maybe he has access to food somewhere else. All right, everything's left is just algebra. So double check the numbers, then we're done. You get five thirds for alpha? Huh? No. For alpha, I had 1.154. AG is 1. Point. Can you show me how you got alpha? I got 1.67. No, that's not. I got, one, I got five thirds, basically 1.6 would be right. But that's not right, is it? I don't know. I can show you, but it's just algebra. The physics is done. And F is 9.6, which is less than 30. So I think I'll. Bill got what I got, Dave got what I got, so the minus signs must be okay. All right. Oh, yes. Okay. That's what I That's just not the code. I, should have All right. I guess what I'm asking is, were, did you use your third equation, your no-slip equation, to find You have to. To find alpha? You have three unknowns, right. okay. F, A, G, and alpha. You have to have this equation, but you can't, you, you don't, this is not A, G equals R alpha. It's A, G, T equals R alpha. Okay, so I guess we needed a minus sign there but I had it up there. That's because it's accelerating in one direction but turning in the other. So those are, those are uh, the cross product would give you that minus. All right, well check your algebra because several of us got the same answer there. And we'll start again on Friday.